Welcome, everyone, to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross, and it is time for a preview of the 2024 ATP Finals, where the best eight players of the year who are healthy and available come together into one place. In this case, it is Turin, Italy. They play a round robin. They play a semis. They play a final. And at the end, we have an ATP Finals champion. Fifth biggest title of the year as far as points is concerned probably as far as prestige is concerned as well. Uh, And it's always uh, a very special event in a unique format. Looking forward to it as always. I was planning on breaking down some tennis this week. Simply ran out of time. So it was probably overambitious of me to think that I was going to be able to do that. Uh, But not going to happen. This is just going to be an ATP Finals preview. I will say congratulations to Coco Goff, WTA Finals champion, beat Zhang Chinwon in the final. Uh, Congratulations to... Benjamin Bonzi, who played three indoor hardcourt challengers in France and won two of them, runner-up in the third, lost championship points in that one, comes into Mets, qualifies, wins Mets. So just an insane tear that he went on on French indoor hardcourts in, in the last month of the season. Uh, somebody who kind of a mainstay inside the top 75 for three years in a row, really dipped out this year and has kind of salvaged his season. Cam Norian, also a very good week for him. He had the forearm injury after Bostad. He had not won at all really since Bostad. And I think he came into the week hoping maybe for one win, maybe two wins, just to feel a little bit better going into the offseason. He ends up making a final, uh, a little bit nervy in the final. Like in big spots, he just wasn't really making returns. And his return was fine other than that. Uh, Then it felt like every time break point, can't come up with the returns. Uh, So it was kind of frustrating in that respect, but Bonesy played really well. I'll uh, I'll end it there. I couldn't help but talk about a little bit of what happened because I did call the match. Um, I did not see much of Shapovalov, but he wins his first title in over five years. Stockholm. Uh, he was, I think, one in five in finals coming into this one. He defeats Hamad Majedovic, the Serbian wild card, who uh, also, I, I think, came into the week probably not expecting to make a, a run to the final. So big time for him. It's been a tough year for, for him as well. I'd say that was the theme for, honestly, everybody. Because you could say Coco, in some ways, has had a turbulent, like somewhat trying season. She wins. Certainly that's been the case for Bonzi and Nori and Majedovic and even kind of Shapovalov. So big weeks kind of to end 2024. All right. Now I promise I'm done talking about that stuff. Let's look at the groups. Let's look at the groups in turn. All right. We have the Nastas group, Sinner, Medvedev, Fritz, Dimonor. Then you have the Newcomb group, Zverev, Alcaraz, Rude, Rublev. I think given the way things have been going, you got kind of three top guys coming in, three favorites coming in in center Zverev and Alcaraz. And obviously you are going to get one group with, uh, with two and one group with only one. Uh, so I suppose Zverev and Alcaraz have a little bit less margin here and, and you're kind of going to get that clash in, in the group stage, and that's going to be interesting. It's been a it's been a very competitive head to head. And speaking of head to head, the next thing I want to look at, and this is not going to play as well for those listening on audio, uh, but I always like to make a little bit of a cheat sheet for the head to heads coming into the year end championship. So what I have here is a table for those watching on YouTube, uh, and if you read the table left to right, you will see the head to head against the entire field. And then if you continue, uh, you will see the head-to-head against players in the individual group. If you're watching on YouTube, you can pause the video here and examine this however you'd like. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, I'll read off some numbers here, just how the players are overall against the group, okay? Sinner is 16-8 and eight against his group. Zverev is 14-10. and 10. Alcaraz is 10-6. and six. And Medvedev is 14 and 10. Those are the only four players with winning records against uh, the group, and they are also the top four seeds. Fritz is 4 and 8 against his group. Rude is 4 and 12. Dimonor is 8 and 16. And Rublev 
is nine and nine. There aren't a lot of major shocks here when you look at it. Uh, Demon Orr got beat up quite a bit against the top players for many, many years in his career, so I'm not surprised that his numbers don't come out all that great. I am surprised just how bad Ruth looks here. 6-20 and 20 overall against the field, 4-12 and 12 against his group. I, I knew it wasn't going to be great, but I didn't know that he would kind of stick out uh, in, in, such a, in such a big way. I mean, everybody in the field has... 15 or more than 15 wins against the field and Rude only has six wins head to head against everybody uh, everybody else in this competition and then I'll just point out Alcaraz's win rate is insane uh, 26 and 12 against the field overall um, part of that is because he accelerated so quickly into the upper echelons of the sport so you didn't have that dynamic that you had with, let's say, I, I just mentioned it with Demon Orr, but you also had it with the Sinner, where he's playing full seasons on the tour as a sub-top-10 caliber player, getting beat up by some of these top guys, particularly Medvedev and, and Zverev, for a little while there, if you're Yannick Sinner. Uh, and Alcaraz really didn't have that phase. I mean, 2021, he was half-baked, not fully formed, but... It got pretty good pretty quickly, and that helps his record. Still, I don't think that really takes anything away from how impressive it is to be 26 and 12 against the field. Okay, so that is the table. All right, let's get into these groups, and what I'm going to do is just go player by player, give some thoughts, tell you how I'm feeling, tell you who I think they're going to win against and who they are going to lose against, if any. Might be some three and O's, might be some O and threes. Uh, then I'll tell you, uh, I'll show you guys what I think the group is going to look like when it's all said and done. What both groups are going to look like when it's all said and done. So let's start with Nastas and Yannick Sinner. A lot of angles here. Ultimately, there are so many things to like about where Sinner stands coming into this tournament, other than the obvious stuff that he's been dominant on hard courts and he's world number one at the moment by quite some margin. First of all, physically, I think Yannick might be in a really great spot here. The That's contingent on the virus that he pulled out with at the Paris Masters. So there's, I guess, a chance that that knocked him backwards. But he's had two weeks to recover from that. He may have been playing it safe. And all other signs point to this being a very comfortable tournament physically for Yannick Sinner, who is extremely well-rested coming into this event, maybe as well-rested as he's been all year long. If you just purely look at the scheduling of, of it, post-US Open, he's kept it somewhat light, which I think could be key here. And then this is an indoor tournament where you play a lot of short points and you get a lot of days off. Turn is so quick that you play a lot of tie breaks. This is another thing that I look at as an advantage for Sinner. He's been the best tie break player in the world all year long, 24 and 8. And I've been so impressed with his nerve management and his clutchness. And he he's always kind of known exactly what he needs to do in the big in the big spots this year. And uh, there's going to be big spots because the margins are tighter in Turin because of how many holds of serve you get. And I just think Sinner can thrive in those sorts of matches, those tight, close matches. You also have the Italy factor. You have the crowd. Yannick has the benefit right now where the year-end championships... Is a, it's a home tournament for him. And we have not seen Sinner play all that much in Italy, especially because he unfortunately hasn't been healthy for Rome uh, the last couple of years. But ultimately, in general, <clears throat> excuse me, I like it when Sinner plays with a little bit of an edge from an energy standpoint. And I hope that he uses the crowd and plays with some fire. He's been more reserved this year at times for obvious reasons. He hasn't always felt all too comfortable, uh, as comfortable as usual, emoting on court uh, for for portions of this year. But I'd I'd like to see that change here. Just and I think the crowd will nudge him in that direction, which I think is good for him. Now, last year I was actually worried for Sinner. I thought that I did pick him to make the semis, but I thought it might be a little overwhelming for him. You know, first year on championships in the home country, a lot of pressure, a lot of attention. How would he handle it? 
and he handled it beautifully, right? He went 3-0 and in the group. He made the finals. He lost to Novak Djokovic, who put in a gem of a performance. But the fact that Yannick has the experience of handling it and now has way more confidence than he even had coming into the event last year, I think the Italy thing helps him. Then obviously just the pure court conditions. Indoor resume is incredibly impressive. He's got six titles indoors already. He is very difficult to rush off of uh, either wing. I think when the tempo of the rally is frenetic, Sinner is excellent in those sorts of exchanges. And I think his return is a big edge. You're going to have a lot of guys coming in and dominating with their serve. But I think when everybody is sort of getting a lot of kind of easier points on serve, it's that elite level returning that can take that away that is going to sort of separate uh, in in this sort of event. And Sinner can do that. So I think he's going to go 3-0 in the group. I think he'll beat Medvedev, Fritz, and Dimonor. Let's move on to Medvedev, the second highest ranked player in the Nastas group. There have been two issues for Daniil for most of the year. The first issue has been that the serve has regressed to average and the forehand has been less effective, less consistent. At times, the intention has been more aggressive, but the consistency has fallen off. And then at times, the conditions have been so slow that we've seen that classic Medvedev issue of not get, being able to really get the ball through the court. That won't be a problem in Turin. I think off the ground, these are conditions that should suit Daniil quite well. But... I also don't think as a somewhat you know, passive baseliner, I worry that he's not going to be getting enough out of his serve. And in these conditions, I think it's crucial that you're able to use that as a weapon. He did make the final in 2021. That was the first year of Turin. He went 0-3 the next year, 0-3. Uh, last year, he made the semis, and he got outplayed by Sinner handedly in that semifinal. I thought he was fortunate to push it to a third. Uh, but my thing with Medvedev right now is like, why should I feel good about his serve at the moment? He pulled out of Vienna just a couple weeks ago with the shoulder injury. Then he lost first round to Popper in, in Paris, which were really quick conditions. And he posted very modest serving stats in that match. Not horrendous, but modest. So I think he loses to Sinner. I do think he beats Fritz. I think he matches up well with Taylor. I think he loses to Demonor. Alex usually plays Medvedev very, very well. He can bother Medvedev with the speed. So Daniil sometimes can be a little bit lost offensively. Uh, and then Demonor is is really good at net rushing Daniil when he is not mindful of his court positioning. And I, I also wonder with somebody who hits flat and low, um, just like Medvedev does in Demon Or, like when that kind of matchup clashes, I think it takes away even more so from Medvedev's ability to create offense. Taylor Fritz makes the U.S. Open final. Tough draws for Taylor since that U.S. Open. So if you look at him versus top 50 players since New York, he's one and three. You know, had a first-round loss to Draper, had a first-round loss to Feast. And as a result, we haven't seen all that much of him, but we did see a semifinal in Shanghai. Uh, serve return skill, I think, is really great here. But frankly, with the conditions, I like Taylor to have a little bit more time off the ground, especially to load up the forehand. And I think the slower courts sort of help him defend effectively. Sometimes in the quicker conditions, that's where I think... Look, it's it's harder for everybody to defend in quick conditions. I just think Taylor is almost very court speed sensitive as far as his ability to defend. And I I like it when he can kind of work the longer rallies and it gives his ball striking more chances to shine. So I don't love the greased lightning quick conditions for Fritz, uh, but there are some other things I, I do like about Taylor compared to Medvedev and, and Dimonor. I think he's healthier than Medvedev, probably feeling more confident and freer than Medvedev at this point. And I'll get into some some of the stuff with Dimonor, but I 
I don't think Taylor faces the same sort of mental hurdles that Demonora is about to face. So let's talk about Alex. First of all, I think just in general with the form, we haven't seen all that much since the hip injury. Now, he's toughed out a lot of matches. He's got some wins under his belt. And I've watched a lot of these matches. And it's been pretty good. And it's been admirable the way he's sort of been hanging in there and extracting the maximum out of what he's capable of at this time. But I think he's lost a percentage of his physicality, his consistency, his serve quality. Uh, he, he, at times, I think, has had to sort of grind things out. And uh, he hasn't played a player ranked higher than him since Roland Garros, to give you an idea. So essentially, Demonor hasn't played a top 10 player since Roland Garros. It's been a while since we've seen him tested against this caliber. I'm a little worried about the exhale effect, the victory lap effect. Uh, this was a massive goal for Demonor to get here, and it took a massive effort for him to get here. Enormous, like fighting through injury, massive effort. And you worry, look, Demonor is not a guy you normally worry about fight or compete level, but will his motivation take a little bit of a hit? Will there be a bit of an energy dump? I think is more accurate to sort of characterize it as sort of a, a, a bit of an energy dump from Demonor after he climbed this very difficult, arduous mountain. Then there's also the rookie effect. And I just think this is sometimes a hard event to play for the first time because it's so different. You're out of your routine. You're, you don't really have a feel for things and it can be, it can feel pretty big and pretty intimidating. I think, I think he'll lose to center. I think he'll beat Medvedev. I think he'll lose to Fritz. So what we have here in the Nistas group is a 3-0 player in Yannick Sinner who would be the group winner. And then we have three 1-2 players if my projections held. And I give the edge to Taylor Fritz on the tiebreaker. I like his chances to do well a hair more than Demonor and Medvedev on the margins. So I'm going to put Fritz through as the number two in the Nistas group. We'll get to the Newcomb group in a moment, but first, let's take a quick break. This episode is brought to you by Melon. Look, people who've played tennis with me over the years will tell you, I've never been a hat guy, and that's because I felt the hat industry has a problem, which is that you wear a hat for a couple of weeks, you sweat in it, it starts smelling bad, you try to wash it, it loses its shape, it falls apart, and it's a mess. That has been my experience with every single hat until I discovered Melon, because these hats are designed to be the most premium and durable in the world. If you need a hat that's going to keep up with you, no matter what you do, that's Melon. These hats are engineered with antimicrobial properties, not to use a big word on you, but that is why when you sweat in them, it doesn't stain and it doesn't smell. And if you ultimately need to wash these hats, it's not going to lose its shape and it's going to come back looking brand new. This is the Hydro hat my melon hat of choice. It's been tested in lakes, oceans, and pools. It's built for the water. It's not gonna fall apart in these situations. The style part is also really important. Everybody's got a different taste in hats. Melon understands that, so the selection is huge. There are tons of shapes and colors and styles, and there's even a fit finder on the website, so if you're not sure, like, what hat is right for me? What size is right for me? Uh, the site can break down exactly which hat might suit you best uh, to kind of give you a help in that direction. If you're looking for a hat that you can sweat in, that you can play tennis in, you can do whatever you want in, and it's still going to last you five times longer than any other hat, look no further. Go to melon.com. That is M-E-L-I-N.com and put it to the test yourself. As a reminder, the Newcomb group features Zverev, Alcaraz, Rude, and Rublev. So let's run through them, starting with Alexander Zverev coming off the title in Paris. Now, over the years, I feel, unless you're Novak Djokovic, there is usually very little translation to Paris Masters success and year-end championship success. And one of the obvious theories or reasons for that 
would be that the conditions have traditionally been very, very different. But notably this year, Paris played a lot like we've seen Turin play over the last couple of years. And ultimately, you have to be aggressive to win on a court like that. If you hang back and you look to play a lot from neutral and you're allowing yourself to get put into defensive positions quite easily, you're, you're not going to have success in those sorts of speedy conditions. Zverev was aggressive in Paris. So he's got to take that mentality and that tactical mindset and try to translate it over. Of course, uh, the serve can loom large here. And I do think it's going to be in, char- in charge against Rude and Rublev, who I think are probably the two weakest returners in the field. I have Zverev beating Rude and Rublev and beating Carlos Alcaraz, which was a tough decision for me. I think a lot of it will have to do with just how comfortable Alcaraz ends up feeling in these conditions. You know Zverev is going to be comfortable. And that's the difference, and that's why I went with Sasha, especially for a group stage match. And I don't know if it'll be scheduled second or third, uh, but I think where Alcaraz will be the most vulnerable will be his first couple matches uh, and his group stage matches. I think once he gets out of the group and he gets to the semis or perhaps he gets to a final, I, I actually think he will probably play himself into the event. I think he's a likely candidate to do that. I thought it was a pretty good showing for him in turn last year. It was a difficult indoor hardcourt season. Carlos comes in with, I think, more to feel good about in recent months compared to where he was at last year coming into this event. Uh, There is also the story of Ferrero installing the same courts that are being used at these year-end championships at the Juan Carlos Ferro Tennis Academy, which, like, it sounds a little bit crazier than it actually is, right? These court manufacturing companies are very known entities, and they make a lot of courts around the world. So you can easily call up, uh, I think Greenset is the manufacturer, you can easily call them up and say, hey, can you just give us that court? And you're going to build courts at your academy anyway, uh, if you're Juan Car- if you're the Juan Carlos Ferro Academy, uh, I don't know. You might as well, right? I'd say the biggest feather in the cap for Alcaraz is that when his motivation is ultra high and he's playing the biggest events and he's playing top players, he tends to bring out his best stuff. And I, I think this is an event that Carlos, I mean, evidenced by that court move at the Juan Carlos Ferro Academy, uh, I think he's going to want this really badly. And that's usually dangerous for the field. And even at Laver Cup, another event where you kind of bring all the top guys together, Alcaraz does seem to have a little bit of an aura in these sorts of settings. So it's hard to explain, but I do think that that is working in favor of Alcaraz. I do think he'll lose to Zverev, but I think he'll beat Rude and Rublev. Let's go on to Kaspar Ruud. I think I said this on the mailbag, but... I'm not sure a player has ever come into this event in worse form. Root has lost seven of his last eight matches. The entire second half of the season has been pretty underwhelming for Casper. He's only won about nine or ten matches since uh, since Roland Garros. Overall, indoor hardcourt resume isn't very good. Uh, you do have the the one highlight being in 2022 when he did surprise everybody in turn and he made the semifinals. He made it out of his group, even though most people wouldn't have given him a great chance to do so. But I, I think the evidence is clear that Rude was a better hardcore player in 2022 than he has been in the two years after. So I think Rude will lose to Zverev, lose to Alcaraz, and lose to Rublev. I have him going 0-3. I do feel like usually there's a player who goes 0-3 at this event. I don't have stats to back that up, but it just feels like it happens to somebody every year. Medvedev the year before, I believe, went 0-3. So I think it's going to be rude this time. Lastly, Andre Rublev. I like Rublev on all three surfaces. If you look at his career stats, he's pretty even on all three surfaces. But when it gets too quick... It does hurt him. I think the returns in play become an issue. He can't run around his backhand as often. 
So for Rublev, I think there, there are two factors here. I don't like these conditions for him. And there really aren't any impressive wins since the U.S. Open. And that concerns me for a guy who is in the thick of things trying to secure his position in the race. You know that it wasn't a lack of motivation. Uh, you know, you did have the the strange surgery that he had after the U.S. Open that I'm assuming since he came back like immediately uh, didn't have much of an effect, but I'm going to mention it in fairness. Um, he won some matches, but he did not have a very convincing stretch of tennis. I think he'll lose to Alcaraz. I think he'll lose to Zverev. I think he'll beat Rude. So that would leave the final group standings as follows. In Newcomb, you'd have a 3-0 Zverev. You'd have a 2-1 Alcaraz. You'd have a 2-1 Rublev. And you would have an 0-3 Rude. Alcaraz would advance with the head-to-head victory over Andre Rublev. Final weekend prediction. Semifinals, I have Sinner over Alcaraz in three sets. I have Zverev over Fritz in three sets, and I have Sinner over Zverev in two sets. My gut here was was kind of like pulling me towards Alcaraz. I have this weird feeling that he's just going to elevate. I have a strange inkling that this is going to be one of those moments where you think the conditions don't suit Alcaraz, and then he ends up proving you wrong. His Beijing form is the best offensive tennis I've seen all year, and that is somewhat fresh in my mind. But my logical brain says Sinner. There's just way more data to support that in this tight head-to-head that's gone back and forth, that these conditions are going to swing things in favor of Yannick Sinner, who's been better on indoor hardcore throughout his entire career and uh, has been the dominant hardcore player this year by a lot of margin. As far as the Zverev final is concerned, Zverev has a positive head-to-head against Yannick Sinner. What I will say is that Yannick used to have a kryptonite against the counter-punching pace absorber, which is part a big part of Zverev's game. He has figured that out. He has learned how to play it. He has learned how to beat it. He has the return of serve to, to kind of mitigate Zverev's advantage there. Uh, to the best possible extent. And I like Sinner's mental better than Zverev's mental in a tight, big final. Even though this happens to be an event that Zverev has won in the past, and I don't think it brings the same baggage or the same scar tissue as a major, uh, Yannick has been the most clutch player in the game all year. And uh, again, if, if you get passive on these courts in these conditions, which Zverev sometimes can do at the wrong moments and he can lose conviction on that forehand, yeah, against center on these courts, that would be death. So, yeah, um, I see Yannick in that one. And uh, I am going with center to become the 2024 Nito ATP Finals champion. I'm going to be doing a good amount of post-match coverage early. Um, then I'm going to go on play-by-play assignment later in the week, and then I'll be back for Monday match analysis. That's going to be the coverage plan, so stay tuned for those post-match analysis recaps on YouTube. Hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.